first thing we're going to do when we install beadboard wainscoting or beadboard anywhere is we're going to acclimate it. So resist the urge to take all your solid lumber, bring it into a house, and just start nailing it on a wall. If any of you have ever had a hardwood floor installed, you know that the hardwood flooring guys do what? Acclimate their lumber. They acclimate the, the material. How do they do this? They bring it into the structure, and how long do they let it, quote unquote, season for? As long as it takes. As long as it takes. I, I always ask this question, and I, it takes two days, it takes a week, it takes three weeks. My guy, man, he's, he's, my guy's a real pain in the butt. You know what he does? He comes in there and he cranks on, he, he, he takes a plastic lock box and he cranks the thermostat to where he wants it, he sets the humidity to where he, he wants it, and then he puts a plastic lock box over it and he brings the stuff in and every so often he shows up with one of these and he checks the moisture content and he won't install the floor until it's at the right moisture content. Until it's at the right moisture content. Do you think he does this for a reason? Why does he do this? He does this because what he doesn't want to see happen with his hardwood floor is what can happen with any solid wood material if we take it and we don't acclimate it and understand what's going on with the moisture content. All solid lumber has a specific moisture content. This is going to be one of the best friends you can possibly have. This is a simple moisture meter. Check the moisture content of your lumber before you install it. Let it acclimate, let it season, whatever your term is, until it reaches the same ambient level as the uh, level excuse me, as a relative indoor humidity. You don't want to deal with some crazy movement. Typically a, seven to eight percent is average yeah. for our climates. Typically. Typically. Right. Though in the summer, if it's not an air-conditioned space, it may be higher. And there's no shame if it's higher. We just need to make sure that we're not taking bone dry material and bringing it into a damp environment, like which is probably what happened here. This was probably dried to about a seven or eight percent moisture content from what we guess it probably hit the exterior environment, and this may have been installed in a really humid area, and ultimately took on a lot of moisture. Hi, Gary. It took on a lot of moisture, and it started buckling. And this is the end result. We want to make sure we manage that. So one way to manage it is to check the moisture kind and understand what you're installing. Okay, let's talk about scale and proportions. Scale and proportions are critical to any finished carpentry project. Your work's not going to look good if the scale, the proportions, and some of these details aren't executed properly. So the rule of thumb, and this is there's kind of, you know, there, there's some variables here. This is not a hard and fast rule. But the rule of thumb we use is that one-third of the wall height is going to be covered with beadboard. For a typical traditional installation, if you're dealing with a craftsman or an arts and crafts style house, that rule of thumb may jump to two-thirds. You may see some really high wainscoting. It looks really neat. But for the sake of argument here, we're going to assume that we've got roughly a nine foot ceiling. I know our wall is cut off at seven and a half feet. We have constraints here with these little Hollywood set. In reality, we, this wall would probably come up another foot and a half or so, give or take, and the ceiling would be somewhere up in here. And then this, more, this proportion is going to be much more pleasing to the eye. Uh, another thing to take into account, the one-thirds is a general rule of thumb. Uh, a lot of times I'll go into a room and look for an architectural line of some sort that I can accent off of, be it a mulling strip in a window or some other detail in the room that I can highlight which allows the whole thing to kind of tie together into one cohesive feel. Absolutely. Great tip. You know, the, the eye loves to see level lines going around the room. It's, it's very pleasing for whatever reason. Any finished carpenters here? True finished carpenters. No, okay. Yeah, you are. What's finished carpentry all about? Making it look right. There's something that's key to making it look right. What is it? What looks right in this picture? Let me start there. What looks right in this picture? Amazingly enough, what looks right? The bottom. The bottom? The, 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 the door itself. The door itself looks right, doesn't it? Why does it look right? I'll give you a hint. Forget, we're not talking, no, 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 we're not talking about any of this. We're talking about the door itself. I, I, don't, I don't care what you're talking about. But we're talking about the door itself. Why does that door look right? Come on, take it over. Shadow lines. Shadow lines. Shadow lines. Reveals. This, this is like the secret tip to, to finish carpentry. Shadow lines are finish carpenter's best friend. The more shadow lines, the more reveals, the more margins, the more offsets, whatever you want to call it. The more shoulders that you have, the better your work is going to look. Why doesn't this look right? What's, come on, what's, thank you. Was this hard? It's flat. It's flat. It's like this guy's head. It's flat. 
It's absolutely flat. Here. You'll get a pencil for we'll it. We'll give you a cup. Well, you're not getting anything. You get a couple of pencils. I got all excited for a moment. Poor guy. It's flat. It's like this giant smudge, isn't it? It's like somebody painted a wall and then took their thumb and did this all over it. You've seen photographs that look really terrible because there's not enough detail. There's not enough pop to them. There's not enough pop going here. There's a lot going on here. There's a whole, there's a whole lot of effort that went into this, isn't there? Look at this down here. you got one, two, three, four, five. Six, seven, eight, a minimum of eight pieces just in the trim, plus all the beadboard, and it is all wrong. Because they stacked it. They just layered it. They didn't pay attention to reveals, proportions, shadow lines, or anything else. They didn't get it. What's this? What's this down here? What are those? What are they? You know what they are. What are they? They're rosettes. They're not, those are not plinths. Those aren't plinths. Where's our plinth block? Give me the plinth block, please, Ben. Those are not plinths. Those are rosettes. Rosettes go in the upper corner of a window, or sometimes if you're going to picture frame a window, you can make an exception and use them in the lower corner. Rosettes don't ever touch the floor. Period. You tell a little passionate about this. Rosettes don't touch Hot the button. floor. Where's our plinth? Where's our plinth block? It's right here. There we go. This is a proper plinth. The plinth is always wider than the base. Always. There are no exceptions to this that I'm aware of. Do you know of any? Okay. The plinth is always wider than the base. It's not shorter than the base. I'm actually pretty sure that there's classical laws about that. There are. There are. We won't get into it. We, we could spend hours just on the classical scale and proportions. We won't go there. Notice I said we. So the plinth is all wrong because it's not a plinth, it's a rosette. What's this? What, what's really going on here? We got kind of like a few different pieces of base. They tried to line, to your point, Ben, they actually tried to line the top of the base up with the, the, the bottom of the door rail. That was my okay. Fault. That was my fault. That, what's that? That was my fault. It was yours? Yeah. Oh, that was your point. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I misunderstood. I'm sorry. Here. Here. Here you go. <laughs> So there was this effort. There was there was really this effort made, and I'm not. And look, I'm not here to make fun of anybody. I, I recognize we all learn, and I, I would have done stuff like this years ago because I didn't know any better. I probably still don't know any better, but anyhow. Fake it so make it. There, there was a lot of effort that went into this, but they didn't quite get it right. So what else is going on? No scale, no proportion. No, this doesn't really relate to anything. The shadow lines are all smudged. This. What about the transition between the casing and the beadboard? How do we handle that? We're going to show you how to handle that. How about the, the, this rail up here? What's going on there? How come? What's this? What is that? Yeah, it's, it's some type of cap, some type of smudge cap. But what's this cut? What do we call this cut? That's not a self-return. That's self a butt return cut. Self-return would be that's correct. A, that's a 90-degree butt yeah. cut. That's what we call a butt cut or a square cut. And you great. don't use those in this application. A self-return would have been better, though still not historically correct. So we want to address all of these issues. We've got a little mock-up on our set, and these are we're going to try and hit some of the, the areas you guys are probably going to encounter most with your beadboard installation. Yeah, thank you.